What's up, YouTube? So today I want to talk about a New York Times article I saw a few days ago titled The Hard Part of Computer Science, Getting Into Class. Now the reason I want to talk about this is I think so much of the conversation around higher education and college revolves around student loan debt, the amount of debt that students are taking on, which I think now exceeds a trillion dollars. But what we're usually not talking about is the actual business side of it, the higher education, the colleges themselves, and what is now their inability to actually be able to do the only thing they're really paid to do, and that's teach students. So I think this is indicative of a now failing education system. I think this might be the sign of the higher education bubble bursting. So I want to take a closer look at this article and give you some of my thoughts. The article starts out, lured by the prospect of high salary, high status jobs, college students are rushing in record numbers to study computer science. Now, if only they could get a seat in class. On campuses ar across the country, from major state universities to small private colleges, the surge in student demand for computer science courses is far outstripping the supply of professors as the tech industry snaps up talent. At some schools, the shortage is creating an undergraduate divide of computing haves and have-nots, potentially narrowing a path for some minority and female students to an industry that has struggled with diversity. Now, first off, even when we're talking about the inability for students to get into college classes, in this case, computer science classes, which, you know, they bring up a good point, haves and have-nots, you're going to have groups of people that are either able to get into these classes, get educated, and then potentially get a job, and then there are those students who are just going to miss out. They still have to bring up the diversity issue here. I mean, this is something that's affecting all college students. Any student that is trying to get into a computer science class is potentially affected by this, yet they still just have to throw in that whole diversity narrative. They say the situation has become so acute that Swarthmore College, which was already holding lottery to select students for computer classes is now capping the number of courses that computer science majors may take. Imagine spending tens of thousands of dollars to go to a college to get educated only to realize that what you're receiving in return is a lottery ticket. The one thing that a college is supposed to do, which is provide an education to you in return for the money that you give them, what you instead get is a lottery to become educated in the subject that you're interested in. Another thing worth noting here is that they're capping the amount of classes a computer science major can take. I mean, this really just shows how broken our education system is because imagine going to a gym where, you know, you say, I want to take a yoga class, I want to take the CrossFit class, I want to take the cycling class, I want to take all of these different classes. A for-profit business like that, a gym is excited when a customer wants to take more classes, that means more money for them. That means they're interested and, you know, you're probably going to pay them next month because you're upping the amount of classes that you can take. But at colleges, which make so much of their money from federally subsidized student loans and, you know, they don't have much competition, their solution is to just cap the amount of classes you can take. Now, short term, this might be a legitimate strategy. You know, you don't realize the amount of demand that you're going to have, so you have to temporarily cap things as you increase the amount of professors that are available. But long term, this seems to be their go-to strategy. I mean, we have lotteries, we have them capping the amount of students or the amount of classes that students can take. This is just not how a business should be responding to what is really the best problem any business could want which is more demand and more demand for classes. It's the perfect situation. Now, to be perfectly honest, a situation like this is actually good for somebody like me who's already in the industry because the amount of demand for labor is higher than ever and it continues to grow, yet the supply of labor isn't keeping up and the supply of labor is only going to be hurt even more with policies like this, when they're holding lotteries to get into class, when they're restricting the amount of classes a student can take, that's only going to further restrict the supply of labor that's entering the market. So for somebody like me, this is actually good because that means less competition, which means my value within the market actually increases. But something like this can only go on for so long because businesses have needs. 
they have jobs they need to fill, and if traditional outlets like colleges aren't able to provide them that supply, then they're going to start looking elsewhere. They're going to start looking towards coding boot camps. They're going to start looking at alternative education systems or even self-taught developers that just skirt the education system entirely and teach themselves. And likewise, on the supply side, the programmers, they might realize, hey, if I'm just going to be signing up for a lottery or if I'm going to be paying, paying tens of thousands of dollars to enter a system where I'm not even going to be able to take all the classes I want to take, is it really worth it? And this is when something like the higher education bubble might start to burst because on both sides, there's this frustration with the current system that isn't able to meet the market needs. Going on, they say, at the University of California, San Diego, introductory lecture courses have ballooned up to 400 students to accommodate both majors and non-majors. As a result of such changes, students on some campuses said they felt shut out of computer science, while others said they faced overcrowded classes with overworked professors. Now, something like overworked professors is a symptom of a larger problem, and that is that there's little mentoring and little one-to-one -one teaching time between the teacher and the student. And this, to me, really shows why, in our day and age, it's more important than ever to develop the skill of learning how to teach yourself new skills. If you need proof, this is it. The fact that there's overcrowded classes and little access to professors shows the importance and the need for the ability to teach yourself new skills. Even within the prestigious higher education system that we have, you're not going to have access to your teachers the way you want to. So at the end of the day, if you're trying to pass tests, if you're trying to get the skills necessary to compete on the job market, you're going to have to learn how to teach yourself these skills. Now, the ability to teach yourself a new skill, I think, is just a valuable skill to have in general, regardless of what your job is or the industry that you're in. But if you're in programming, if you're in tech and you're in computer science specifically, I think it might be the most important skill you can have because everything's changing, everything's constantly evolving, and the tools that you're using today might not be the tools that you're using four or five years from now. So the ability to teach yourself a new skill is the most important thing ever, and it's something I'm always doing. When I first got into the industry, I was using this framework, AngularJS. A couple years later, Google released a new framework, Angular. When a new tool is just created out of thin air, it's not like there are all these online courses you can go to. It's not like you can sign up for a course at your community college because the framework, the tool, was literally just created. I had to teach it to myself. I had to go online, read through the documentation, and learn this framework. It's not an easy thing to do, and it's one of the reasons why I think something like programming is going to be so frustrating to a lot of people because it's not something like accounting where, you know, Accounting's not really evolving year after year. I think accounting's pretty much accounting, whereas something like programming is always evolving. And that's one of the reasons why once I went through the struggle of learning Angular, I realized, hey, there's this huge market opportunity. There's probably a bunch of people like me who need to learn this framework. Maybe I should write a book about it, which you can check out at theangulartutorial.org. Later in the article, they say, some universities now require incoming students to get accepted into computer science majors before they arrive on campus and make it nearly impossible for other undergraduates to transfer into the major. Now, this is actually a good thing because at least you know ahead of time, like, hey, I didn't get into this major, so now I'm not going to give them money, as opposed to the alternative system where you pay them up front to get into their college and then once you arrive on campus, you realize, oh, wait, the enrollment is capped. Now I don't actually get the services I was expecting in return for that money. So this is actually a good thing, but still part of a larger problem. And then they go on to say, that approach can favor incoming students from schools with resources like advanced programming courses. It can also favor male students because women on average are less likely to have taken a computer science course in high school. Now the whole favoring students from schools with resources like advanced programming courses, that's actually legit. You know, I went to a school where there wasn't 
computer science courses. There weren't programming courses. So if I was trying to get into one of these colleges and I didn't have that high school credit to get in, yeah, I would be disadvantaged by this. But it also goes on to say that it can also favor male students because women on average are less likely to have taken a computer science course in high school. Yes, and college basketball scholarships also tend to favor students who played basketball in high school. You can't say that there's preferential treatment for one type of student over another when they chose to take those classes. I mean, unless there is some sort of discrimination at the high school level where girls aren't allowed to take these programming courses, which I don't think there is, this isn't indicative of a problem. There isn't a problem here. If anything, this just gives proof that James Damore's Google memo might have had a point. Now, the big problem here is that colleges just simply don't know what to look for when they're looking for teachers. They just have this entire system completely backwards. Still, the pipeline of professors is limited, partly because of economics and partly because university hiring is geared toward long tenure appointments, not the latest trends. They say, I had a faculty member who came in with an offer from a bank, and they were told that with their expertise, the starting salary would be $1 million to $4 million. There's no way a university, no matter how well off, could compete with that. And just below this, they have a little chart that shows the number of undergraduates charted against the number of PhD candidates. As you can see, undergraduates are skyrocketing, PhD candidates are staying flat. And no, note the little caption here says American universities more than doubled from 2013 to 2017, that being computer science undergraduates, and the number of PhD candidates, the potential pool of future professors remained relatively flat. Now to me, the question here is obvious. Why are PhD candidates your potential pool of professors? Teachers don't need credentials. Teachers need to know how to teach. That's all they need. You don't need to have a PhD to be able to teach. All you need to do is be able to teach a subject well. It doesn't matter what type of piece of paper you have. But of course, we're talking about higher education here. They're fucking obsessed with pieces of paper. So is it any surprise that they would need a piece of paper in order to feel that you're qualified to teach a subject? When a business has a cost that's as high as one to four million dollars, you tend to look for an alternative. You tend to look for a substitute good. You don't just sit there and bitch and moan about the fact that your good now costs one to four million dollars. This is what businesses do. When resources get expensive, they find a way to cut back on those resources. They look for another resource to replace that resources. This is how businesses operate. But higher education isn't really a business because they're so propped up with federally subsidized student loans. What they need to realize is that the best talent out there right now is hidden talent. The best teachers out there, and I strongly believe this, aren't people with PhDs within the walled gardens of higher education. They aren't people who have been teaching a subject for 10, 20 years, because that doesn't necessarily mean you're good. That just means you've been given some stupid fucking credentials by higher education. The best teachers out there right now are probably on YouTube. They're probably live streaming on Twitch right now or live streaming on YouTube right now. Those are the best teachers. And I guarantee you that somebody who's just creating YouTube videos or live streaming for a hobby that freaks out every time they get a Twitch sub probably isn't going to demand one to four million dollars. Higher education needs to realize that they're looking at the wrong pool of talent. They keep going to PhD candidates, which these big businesses want to buy up, rather than realizing, oh, we're targeting the wrong skill set. We don't need to target PhD candidates. We need to target people who know how to fucking teach. But they're not willing to change. And this is going to be the downfall of our higher education system. Now, just to really solidify my point on how obsessed these people are with credentials and how unwilling they are to look at a more, let's say, diverse set of candidates to potentially teach some of these subjects. At the end of the article, it says, Dr. Clawway at Harvey Mudd is weighing a more academic solution to meeting student demand. She wants to train people with PhDs in subjects like math, physics, and biology to teach computer science, potentially increasing the supply of professors. 
Again, this insistence on PhDs to teach subjects. First of all, you don't even have a pool of professors to teach the subjects. Now you want to teach other PhDs, computer science, and somehow magically you think this is going to solve the problem. Instead, you need to change. You need to think outside the box. Stop being so academic and realize that just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you know how to teach. You need to target and find people who know how to teach these subjects, regardless of whether or not they have a credential to back them up. If you're serious about getting into programming, I would advise you to seriously question taking the traditional route of going through college. As you've already seen, you might have to participate in a lottery, you might not get into the classes you want to get into, and even if you do, you're going to be in classes that are gigantic, you're not going to have much one-on-one -on -one time with your professor, so why not prepare yourself for the future and teach yourself how to program? Because once you're in the industry, you're going to have to do it anyways. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you have some thoughts, I'd love to hear them below. Do you think this is just a bump in the road for higher education? Or are you on my side and think this is the beginning of the end for the American college system? And if you are learning how to code, or if you're thinking about learning how to code and you're looking for an alternative source of education, I would recommend the Angular Tutorial. You can find out more information at theangulartutorial.org. As of right now, it is the highest rated book on Amazon covering Angular and automated testing. I have received nothing but five-star reviews. So again, you can check that out at theangulartutorial.org. Thanks for watching.